my name is Matt Boyle. I'm one of the founders of the Clever Barkeep and also Drink Atlantic. So um, we will be online this year and next year, hopefully we'll be able to invite you into our beautiful province for some oysters, some bubbles and some great cocktails. So uh, with no further ado, I just want to pass it over to our host and introduce to you that I'm sure that many of you already know this man because I think he's been to every cocktail festival, maybe around the world, maybe your bar as well. Um, just a fantastic person and a big supporter of what we've been doing with Drink Atlantic. It wouldn't be possible without this guy's tireless worker. Um, he's the principal for Sovereign Canada. He's also the corporate liaison for the CPBA. Uh, so he's doing a lot of work in the background to help all of us succeed in the bartending industry. Um, it, he also has a crazy Rolodex in the bartending world. So if you want to meet somebody, he probably knows that person or somebody that knows that person. So uh, no further ado, John Smolensky, thanks for hosting today. And the floor is yours, my man. Oh, cheers, Matt. And uh, I'm uh, uh, super kind words and uh, super excited for today. Um, it's, uh, I guess I'm a, in some sense, I'm a bit of a social monster. So <laughs> I, uh, I, know, I know a lot of people. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just the host today. Um, but when, uh, when Matt and, and Jeff approached me to uh, help uh, produce Drink Atlantic, uh, like most cocktail conferences that, that I'm a part of, um, I'm like, well, you know, one of my first, very first phone calls has to be to Dorothy. Um, uh, Dorothy, Dorothy Elizabeth, well, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to embarrass her a little bit and I'm going to read off some of her accolades because um, Dorothy is probably one of the best bartenders uh, in, in the world that you may have heard of, but you may not have heard of because I know there's a lot of people joining from Canada today. So um, aside from uh, being uh, having a, what is it, a master's in chemical engineering from, from University of Michigan, um, Dorothy is also the, the Dean for Applied Science at, at uh, Portland Cocktail Week. Um, in uh, 2016, she was named uh, Eater, one of Eater National's Young Guns. In 2017, she was inducted into the Tales of the Cocktail Dame Hall of Fame, um, which is pretty rad. Um, she's currently working for Mace, and she's done a lot of work for um, uh, uh, the Lion Group uh, as well. Or I, I'm not sure if you're still working for Lion Group or not, but I don't know who's working where right now, <laughs> um, I suppose. Um, and um, she's one of the brightest minds in, in our industry when it, when it comes to uh, not just molecular mixology, but having fun with it. Um, having lots of fun with cocktails behind the bar and, and geeking out on, on science. And so um, it's a true pleasure to have her on. And she's taken time out of her Sunday. And um, she was in Halifax last year uh, uh, helping um, uh, do a seminar on bitters, which was brilliant. She's also done some work with uh, PDX's uh, distant learning thing um, uh, modules. And today, we're, and today we get to be joined by her uh, behind the bar at Mace. So um, without further ado, Dorothy, <laughs> if, if, um, and by the way, um, if, uh, if you can put um, uh, speaker mode on, on your Zoom, um, so uh, that way Dorothy will be able to, you'll be able to see Dorothy when she's um, spe uh, speaking. And if there's any questions that you have during Dorothy's discourse, make sure that you um, stick them into the chat and I'll monitor the chat. But today, Dorothy's going to teach us uh, a whole bunch um, about uh, molecular mixology and also some techniques that we can use during in, at our home bars, in our own kitchens, um, and uh, practical things that can make our cocktails more fun. Dorothy, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Well, hey, everybody. I am super excited to be here. I had a fantastic time in Halifax for Drink Atlantic, and it was probably one of the drink festivals that just like warmed my ice cold heart because it was like very welcoming, very Canadian, great hospitality. I was very into it. And I'm very excited to be here to do molecular mixology at home. Um, I know when we think of molecular mixology, it one sounds super pretentious because it, it does sound really pretentious. It just is. Like if someone's like, I'm doing molecular mixology, you're like, okay, you might be a douchebag. Um, but guess what? It's not that threatening. It's not that pretentious. And it's basically just taking 
the idea of scientific principles, which we all learned when we were in high school or elementary school or middle school or college even, it's taking the scientific mindset and applying it into a food-based setting. So a lot of these things are chemistry and physics principles that you learn, but um, they, hold on, sorry, my computer had a weird pop-up. But they're, things that allow you to have a better understanding as to what you're doing as a home bartender or as a just a bartender in general. Um, I'm kind of structuring this around things that you can either like easily acquire, things you might already have, or kind of kind of highlight some like fun little cheap toys that you can purchase um, that can elevate your drink making. Um, and so when we're thinking of science and cocktails, I like to think of it first as what I want to do and what the nature of the ingredients are. So if I'm thinking of all the different flavors or what's currently in season and I want to harness it and use that flavor in the most efficient manner, how am I going to go about doing that? So the first thing to think of is the nature of your ingredients. So if I'm really into allspice, or cinnamon or cardamom. So those are spices, these are dried, they don't have a water content. If it's super seasonal and like at the moment, it's like in New York, we have like watermelon, corn's coming up. We have all of these really beautiful things, but if I wanna take a snapshot at the season and try and figure out how to harness those flavors that isn't just muddling them, that's when we can take the idea of the science of food and create something that's really delightful. Um, so my main thing is I don't like to add a lot of chemicals into everything that I do. I like to take what I'm using and figure out the best way to harness it. Um, so for example, if I want to use watermelon, which I previously mentioned because I'm a sucker for watermelon. The thing is, is that Watermelon, when it's good and it's ripe, tastes delicious. But if you have it when it's outside of that window of the season, when it's delicious, it can taste one super watery, kind of like very green and vegetal. It doesn't taste as good. Um, so you have a brief window, but if you're working on a cocktail menu and you are working in a window larger than what that current season is, you can play with it and create something really delightful. So um, first thing I like to think of is when we're talking about the nature of the ingredients, we're going to think of water content. And so as I said, if you're working with a spice, no water content. If we're working with a green, like for example, I have some mustard greens right here. Greens have a minimal water content, but it's not that much versus if we're using a fruit or a vegetable. and with a range of water content. So if I'm working with watermelon or strawberry that has a really high percentage of water, so you're looking at like 96% versus you're looking at an apple, which is very fibrous, or if I'm working with a bell pepper, which has an even lower content of water. Um, and so when you think of those, there are different approaches that you can take. First being, if I'm working with something that has no water content at all, um, for example, if I'm using a spice, I can do a sous vide infusion, or I can use my ISI. Um, if you don't know what an ISI is, they're super handy. They're actually just little whipped cream chargers. Um, it's pretty popular to do ISI rapid infusions. Um, so rather than when you think of your infusion that you typically have, if you are new to bartending or it just sounds something mysterious, a lot of people back in like 2004 would like chop up their fruit, throw it in a bottle, and then it would just sit there for like a month until the flavors got ripe. Well, since we started using more scientific approaches, I don't have to wait for a month for my flavors to enhance. I can use my ISI or I can use my sous vide um, to essentially take that process that would be a month or a week or several days and we can do them in the matter of hours or in the matter of a few minutes. Um, and so I'm gonna just do a brief demo on an ISI. These things, you don't really wanna get a super cheap ISI. If you're working with a commercial in a kitchen setting of any sort, you can find these guys anywhere. You don't wanna confuse it with a soda siphon because a nifty little thing 
Um, soda siphons have like a long tube, and if you try to apply this perch to it, you'll create a bomb. And if there's the number one rule in cocktails, it's don't make a bomb and don't kill yourself. So. It's a good rule. <laughs> At um, Portland Cocktail Week this past year, I did a big presentation on carbonation and gases, and there was like a whole slide on like, do not do these things. You'll make a bomb, you can kill yourself. So this is a pressurized container. Let's be really cognizant of that. Um, let's note if we're using an um, ISI. The biggest thing to know when you're using these is they'll typically be a band that says NSF on there, especially if you're American. The Natural Science, Found um, National Science Foundation, so it means that it's a pressurized container, it's been approved. Um, they'll typically be slightly more expensive, but it'll let you know that it's a safe container. Um, and so when I'm thinking of you using an ISI, this is best used for small ingredients. Specifically, I'm, I'm trying to make a tincture, um, and tincture being like a high concentration flavor infusion, kind of like how you would make a bitter. Um, like you could technically do versions of bitters in here. Um, we've done it where we've ground up chili peppers and did like Thai chili infusions. Um, I'm gonna be making one with cardamom for you right now. Um, I'm not going to be using whole spices. I find it's best if you're using powdered. So the idea if you're using powdered like this, you wanna increase your amount of surface area to liquid ratio. Um, so I'm just going to put my little cardamom powder in here. And while you're doing that, I'll just, uh, just for the Canadians out there, you, you can get uh, an ISI canister fairly easily at, uh, I think London Drugs or Shop Shoppers Drug Mart. You can find, find one of these. What he said. <laughs> All right, and since I'm making a tincture, I'm just putting in some neutral spirits. So this is just like a vodka. Um, and I'm gonna screw it on nice and tight. Big thing is, is when you're doing anything, you wanna make sure everything that you're doing is fairly tight. And so we might think of what does this have to do with an infusion? Like how is this going to do what three weeks in the back of my back bar or in the back of my fridge, like how is it going to get the same level of flavor? And so the fun thing is, is when you're manipulating flavors, it's all based off of how you apply the kinetic energy to facilitate diffusion. So you can either do it by temperature based. So using a sous vide, applying heat to it. You can do it by concentration. So that's where if you have a lot of one substance seeping in another, the molecules will naturally move back and forth, but it'll be at a slower pace. Um, and then you can do it by applying kinetic energy, like actually actively moving it, or you can do it by applying pressure. And by changing pressure, you're ultimately also changing the temperature. Applying more pressure, the molecules are moving a little bit tighter. They're rapidly in motion. So with this, I'm just going to apply two charges to it just to screw this off. Um, the big thing uh, with using an ISI you don't want to overcharge it because you think about it, it's a finite amount of space and you don't want to push too many things into it or it could explode and that's dangerous. So these are super easy. I just put them in like here. I have these little canisters. You can get them at almost any food supply um, business or even the shady head shops. Hippies <laughs> love those canisters. They're legal here now. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you can hear it. Once I screw it in, you can hear the gas going in. And then I'll just give it a little shake. So when you're using any sort of liquid, like if it's alcohol or water, and you're making a tincture and you're applying a gas, nitrogen is typically just there to apply pressure. Like it's not going to dissolve into the solution. But what it is going to do is as I'm shaking it, it's gonna force out any of the oxygen out of solution and get it into the headspace. So what I have here is I have my liquid with my cardamom powder and I have a headspace which has nitrogen placed in which ups the pressure and it also has any oxygen that was in the solution kind of forcing up to the top. So I'm gonna to apply two charges here. Now Dorothy, there's some questions rolling in which is great. Awesome. Um, which is which is great. So first of all, can you explain wh which chargers that you're using because you can get m multiple ones? Um, These are nitrogen-based canisters. Um, let's see if you can. These ones are just they say ISI on them. Mm -hmm. These ones are 
ultra pure, which is probably just like, I'm not gonna say a shady knockoff brand, but like they're nothing extraordinary. When you're using gases, the big thing is, is you don't wanna apply CO2. Um, carbon dioxide works differently than nitrogen does. Um, nitrogen is stable, CO2 is not. CO2 will want to like go into your solution and carbonate it. It also facilitates more of a metallic flavor overall. Um, so it can totally change your flavor. So if you're trying to do a rapid infusion, and you're trying to do it with carbon dioxide, it's not going to work at all. So we're using nitrogen. And and that's uh, that's an important point because when you go to the stores up here, you'll find off the shelf generally two kinds of chargers, the CO2 ones and the N2O ones. So you're using the nitrogen ones. Yes, so I'm using the nitrogen ones. Um, the CO2 ones will typically be used in a soda siphon. Um, I'm going to do a brief demo on carbonation with a tank. I don't have mm. CO2 chargers. Um, if you're using any of these styles of vessels on the instructions or you'll be able to see what kind of gas they want to use for, this is good for nitrogen. You can get some that are good for both um, NO2 and CO2. And then the soda siphons, which I said you don't want to make a tincture in, those will traditionally be just for CO2. So for this, I'm just going to shake it up a little bit more. Um, and then I'll just slowly release some of my gas. So what is that doing when you release the gas? What what is it? What's it? What's happening inside? So the pressure that's in this headspace is going to slowly decrease, um, and it allows me to slowly kind of decrease the total pressure of the vessel before I open it and strain everything off. So I've applied my two charges. I've shaken it up. This is going to be as good as it's going to be. Um, so now I can just. Let me find a little glass. <laughs> it's okay. I love I love all the questions coming in here. Oh, so that's great. Ask all the questions. I'll answer them prob probably. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I have a lot. I think the reason I'm hosting is because I'm nerding out too. <laughs> but so, uh, you can see as I'm pushing it out, there is a little gas that's suspended into it. So you can see the nitrogen kind of like forming a little bit of a head. And that's not like dissolved into the solution. That's just how nitrogen is. Nitrogen will like bond and aerate slightly, but it will dissipate. Kind of very similar to how you have a Guinness and it has a head on top, but if you leave your Guinness on the table for hours, it'll dissipate. This will dissipate faster. I've never done that before. I've never, usually when there's a Guinness in front of me, I'm, I'm drinking it. <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, JVH, um, uh is uh is in the is in the chat room what's up jeff um he's asking uh what the approximate ratios um for uh, uh that you use when you're doing isi infusion so in this case you're doing cardamom powder and vodka is there a hard and fast rule um so this will depend on what you're using and so if it's a like a heavily tannic spice like a tea or something that it dissolves very easily um, or will infuse very easily, um, I'll use a lower ratio. But for this, I typically stick with like 100 grams to 1,000 and kind of that like 1 to 10 ratio and then play with it from there. Um, the big thing is, is that you do get, I wish I just, is there like smell o vision Can you smell this? Like, <laughs> Everyone go to your kitchen and grab some cardamom and join in. <laughs> Aromatics, I smell it. <laughs> yeah. But um, I stick with the one to ten, um, specifically because you're using like, if you're making a tincture, you're using like a, typically a higher proof alcohol, and then you're it's already powdered. If you were using, say, I was using whole cardamom pods, there's a lower surface area ratio, and so you would either need to do several rounds of it or a higher concentration. So I typically stick with one to ten. And that's um, by weight. By weight. Yeah. So I, I'm a huge sticker. Always measure by weight. I mean, if you're doing something at your home and you're just hanging out, I mean, you don't have to get a scale out. But if you're working on your bar program and you want to breed consistency, and you're not the only person that's doing prep, um, or even if you just want to do something a little bit more consistent, measuring by weight is always one of the most important things that you can do. Um, so, so this is my tincture. So as you can see, it's still pretty grainy. It's very, oh wait, this is where my camera is. It's still pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
Love it. <laughs> oh, pretty grainy. So I'm not going to take this and just throw it in a bottle. I'm going to take this and run it through a coffee filter or a micro bag. You don't need to clarify it. So no need to like try and run it through a centrifuge or anything like that. Um, these you can just fine strain it. Most, if not all, the powders will come out and you'll be left with a tincture that will have some color. So the brown will dissipate through um, and it'll be nice and aromatic and you can use it indefinitely because it's pretty much shelf. It is shelf stable. It's just alcohol. Now, now what happens if I use too many charges? Like what's the, what's the downside? You said you're using two and I'll, I'll generally do two. Um, I use two because um, I don't want to make a bomb, one. Uh, it's also consistency sake. I've been troubleshooting this so many times. I use two. I think the max when you're singly applying to an ISI is like three. If you're feeling risky, go for four, but I wouldn't do it. I stick with two, max three, because um, I'm just trying to apply the pressure and get um, get that diffusion of the cardamom into the alcohol solution. Um, so trial and error and safety. Those are the main reasons behind it. So you took fair enough and safety, obviously safety, safety first, not third. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, the, so every time I do ISI, um, uh, uh, infusions like this, I always have, especially if I'm using granulated products, I always have a heck of a time cleaning the, 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 um, the canister afterwards. Do you happen to have any sort of tips and tricks to effectively clean out your ISIs? Oh, so if I'm cleaning this guy out, and hold on, let me make sure I get all my crap out of here. Um, I'm just sloppy though. <laughs> also as a safety rule, you wanna make sure you take, like you get all the gas out before you screw off the top or the top could like shoot off and scare you or take out your eyeball. And your eyes are too pretty. Yeah. Don't all right. So all of my gas is out. You don't hear anything else. Um, if I'm cleaning everything, most of this stuff just unscrews pretty easily. Um, so this stuff's pretty much good. You can tell these will have a hole in it. So these are used, they're single use. So you won't be able to use them again. This part, so the nozzle will just unscrew. So you will have some contact here that you'll have to clean. I typically just soak everything. Um, so like, and a little bit of sanitizer or detergent. This part will just screw off. No, I got all the gas out, so it's not gonna shoot up at me. This part right here, you just have this one nozzle that connects straight through. So there's not really any, it's a small little surface area. It's pretty tiny. You're not going to get a little scrub brush in there, a scrub brush in there. So ideally, if I'm trying to clean this top part out, I could fill it up with water or sanitizer and then charge it once and shoot out all of the, anything that- Oh, that's a good idea. Um, for this part, this is pretty large. Like you could fit a small brush in here, but I would just throw it in a sink and sand, like let it soak for a little bit and do several washes, like put in some detergent, keep the water running in it, let it go a few times. Um, not good for water conservation, but it'll get it clean. Fair enough. And, and then the, the, uh, there's another question I forgot to ask is when you're, when you're filling up, um, the, the canister with base liquid, is there, is there a level that you stop at? Are you two thirds full or? Typically if I'm trying to do an infusion, I'm working at half. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on the total volume of the canisters, so I think this one is, this is max, what, 1.5 liter? No, 0.5 liters, sorry. Um, Making you do metric. <laughs> I am fully capable of doing metric. I... <laughs> One story, all of my bar programs are in metric. I know, I know. I have someone if they use empirical. I'm like, what's a cup? <laughs> all right, anyway. But you can actually see most of these canisters if they're worth their weight in salt, they'll actually have a little line as to what you can measure to. So while the container's larger, this one you should only put a half a liter in at a time. So this is gonna be practical if you want to make copious amounts of an infusion, but if you wanna make a tincture or a dropper bottle or some play with some home computers, I would mm -hmm. do them. 
That's awesome. Thank you for that. That that's a that's a fantastic demo, and it's so inexpensive to 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 grab and and do at home. So. Speaking of, oh, that was a handy dandy little tool, and you're probably like, well, this isn't very practical. I may not have an ISI. I mean, I don't know how much ISIs are in Canada, but they're not that expensive. I mean, it depends. It's all relative, I suppose. It's all relative, and so you're like, well, that's nice. I'm not purchasing an ISI, but. There is something that most, if not everyone, has access to, and that's Blender. Ooh, I have one of those. <laughs> so this is, I am a huge fan of a Vitamix. These are fantastic. But you can also do what I'm about to demonstrate, which is kind of, people will sometimes call it a Blender infusion, but it's actually, I call it like kinetic-based diffusion because I'm very, I'm a stickler on the word infusion because typically it has to do with applied heat. This one, we're not really implying any heat with it. Instead, we're like blending up our material and applying motion. Um, as I said before, to get molecules to move from one place to another, you either have to like apply heat, um, have a concentration based, apply act actively apply motion or apply pressure. Um, so we're going to play with uh, Vitamix for a moment for a brief demo. I'm gonna plug it in first. I love it. Now, while Dorothy's doing that, you can think about all the different kinds of uh, herbs and spices that you put into your ISI. I like doing coffee uh, in there as well. It really concentrates. Um, yeah, just some examples of what you can do with your ISI. Vanilla bean, as I said before, Thai chili. I've seen someone even do like fresh cucumber, but that didn't really work out very well for them, but they tried. Um, yeah, we've used it with like actual physical mace. Um, like the spice, nutmeg, um, any sort of ground spice, anything dried, it works fantastically with. Mm. Um, so when you're thinking of dried materials, head towards that as an idea. Um, this blender, when you think of blender, we typically think of like frozen drinks and Miami Vices and pina coladas. Um, when I think of my blender, I think of it as a really perfect way to go about incorporating greens and herbs into um, an infusion. I started doing this predominantly when we wanted, there were some days when I worked at Standby and Standby's in Detroit. If anyone's in Windsor and has crossed the border, I worked at Standby for years. It was my baby. I helped open it. I love them. Um, and it's a very food science forward drink program. And we had liquid nitrogen in a cocktail. And it just so happened that you couldn't get liquid nitrogen delivered on Sundays. And of course, Fridays and Saturdays were super busy. So a lot of Sundays we would run out of liquid nitrogen. And so we couldn't get that like bright, vibrant flavors. Um, we had a cocktail called the snake in the grass where we would muddle mustard greens, um, or nitro muddled mustard greens. And it didn't work if you just muddled it. So uh, we would do this technique where we would apply our mustard greens and our gin together and we would blitz them really fast and fine strain it and get a really bright, vibrant, instantaneous diffusion of flavor. Um, the best part is that it leaves um, what you're doing bright green in color um, and it's absolutely delightful. This is not the most shelf stable way of doing things if you are like if you're just a home bartender and you want to play around and do some like basil gin for a punch that you're doing, or you want to do a kale and vodka, I don't know, snap peas and tequila. You're thinking of like small fibrous that don't have a lot of water content, but you want to blitz the flavor together really rapidly. Um, it's not something that you would do and expect to keep for a week. Like if it's something that you would expect to use within like a day, two days, maybe three, because it, since you're blitzing it super rapidly, the, um, the chlorophyll in the leaves will actually diffuse into the solution. And unless you're adding a stabilizer like sodium metabisulfite, it will oxidize and turn brown and it'll start to look kind of like sludge. And that doesn't look very cute. It'll taste great, but it won't look cute. So for this, I'll just add my neutral spirit. I've been using pretty much just neutral spirits across the board for this. Um, also guys, welcome to Mace. I don't think I welcomed you to this space yet, but welcome. 
I was gonna say I'm not sure if we uh, if we did the intros before everyone came on or, or after, but Mace is uh, one of one of the best bars in in the world. So if you ever have the chance to go to New York, go visit it. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, we have a really awesome to go program at the moment. We're doing a bunch of bottled cocktails, um, which is really fun. Um, a lot of them are bottled milk punches and things like that. So if you come to New York, come. But you know, pandemic, it's it's a rough time at the moment. We're not allowed to do to go cocktails in Canada. That's a shame. And well, they're like in Michigan, they can't do the to go cocktails. Yeah. Um, but New York. They just decided there are no rules at the moment, so please drink, drink on the street. <laughs> How much neutral spirit did you just put, put put in there, by the way? Not very much. You're looking at about 400 um, milliliters, and I'm doing about 50, 50 grams of greens at the moment. So this is just a demo. If I'm going to traditionally be doing this at home, I'm going to be looking at like per thousand milliliters um you're going to be using between like 100 and 150 grams of your green so that's a that's a pretty good statistic across the board um if you wanted to do this at home so let me make sure i turn this guy on mm. lights on um and so with, with the vitamix the blades are really sharp um and it's going to cut through the greens really rapidly um main thing is, is that it's applying motion so the chlorophyll is going to diffuse out into the solution. Some of the alcohol will get absorbed into the greens. Um, there will be some suspended solids after you strain it off. And if you keep it for more a day, you'll see some at the bottom. But that's just relative to how fine you strain it. If you wanted to keep it on the longer term, you could clarify it. Um, but that's just, you don't need to do that right now. Um, and by clarify, that means remove the solids. Um, typically, people use that with uh either doing ice bath with agar agar or um using a centrifuge with uh pectinex or ketosol and chetosan uh i can talk more about that if someone has any questions but otherwise let's just do this i've got greens i've got liquor i'm gonna blend it looks like a breakfast smoothie <laughs> So that was done. That was really fast. So you can see here, it's like bright green. It's already starting to oxidize because I, well, it's kind of weird because I also have like purple greens in there too and purple and green don't go together. Um, so I'm going to just fine strain this out. Ideally, if I was doing this for like home use, I would use a coffee filter or a super bag, or like a nut milk bag. Um, and so as you can see right here, I have quite a bit of the solids that are there. So this is a fairly fine strainer like you would use in a cocktail setting. Um, this is just to show it, but ideally I would be using a nut milk bag or a super bag. I love the question. So Matt, Matt wants to know if you can blanch the greens um, to, to help uh, retain color. Um, it will help slightly, but it's not going to be that, it's not going to help that much because as the blender will slightly heat up and so, and with the movement, it will um, slightly discolor. So as we can see from here, it's like super dark. It is green, the lighting in here kind of sucks at the moment, but it is rapidly oxidizing. You can't smell it, but it smells just like a fresh salad. Like it's very like bright and vibrant. Um, in addition to infusing alcohols, this is, if you're ever in a pinch or even you just want to make some mojitos at home and you have some fresh mint or even a julep, instead of using the fresh mint, you can take the mint and just blitz it really fast and fine strain it into a syrup. And then you could have a very, very fresh and delightful syrup that you can use almost indefinitely. Well, not indefinitely. If the syrup has a shelf life, but you can use it for some time. Um, are there any other ways to, that that you could retain color on the on the spot? Like I know if I'm, you know, juicing apples or something like that, I can use, you know. You can add a little bit of acidity. The sodium metabisulfite is probably the best stabler that I've seen. Uh, it is food grade safe in America, but that doesn't say very much. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> 
Um, the uh, another question here is, um, uh, and I think um, uh, you might be able to a answer pretty well. What a Andrew wants to know: What happens if you if you're if you if you do this in an ISI? If you st if you yeah. Um, so the green, you'll get a little bit of a flavor extraction, but you have to think of the fact that you're, it's not going to turn bright green because that chlorophyll is not going to diffuse as rapidly. Um, and it's not going to be as strong as a flavor um, because an ISI works great under pressure, but the more, like, the higher water content of the material that you're putting into the ISI, the less, like, diffusion you're going to get out. Um, and this is why it, it's, it's, you can do it. You will get something. It's not going to be the most delightful and delicious thing that you've had if you had dried leaves like dried basil or kind of like dried spices that's what i feel like the best application is for the isi um but you can do it you can do just about anything as long as you don't make a bomb all right no, fair, no bombs that's the that's the theme of the uh the, the entire drink atlantic seminar <laughs> no bombs <laughs> the theme of all of my seminars yeah is like, um so also thinking of what you can do with your blender, especially if um, there are other things you wanna do. This application is really good for greens across the board. Um, but if you're ever thinking about, oh, I wanna puree fruit and try this. Um, when you're thinking of fruit, it does contain a lot of pectin. And so it's gonna be really hard to get like a nice silky mouthfeel without clarifying. Um, so if I'm taking this and I'm, if I take my blender and I'm like, oh, I'm going to puree some strawberries. And even if I super bag it, and even if I run it through the finest filter that I have, it's still going to have a lot of texture to it. And that's from the pectin that are, is naturally within the fruit. Um, also the strawberries are a little bit more malleable when you blitz them like that. Typically the suspended solids will stay in the solution even after you strain them. Um, and so if you wanted to do that, and Dave Arnold has some really great examples of when you're like blitzing and making a hustino, so that's when you can clarify out an infused liquor, um, and that typically uses Pectinex, uh, you can always do that. But if you don't have access to those chemicals, you can either order them online or just skip adding the fruit and throw it in your soupy instead. Um, so any questions on the blender? No, I mean, I think we, 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 cover, we covered it in due course. I mean, that's a fairly creative way to do uh, in, infusion. If I could just add. Oh, sorry, I said infusion, diffusion. John, if I could just add the, um, you know, as bartenders, we're, we're constantly like trial and erroring it with uh, infusions and stuff like that. I think that, you know, understanding these chemical compounds in it would just make, make our lives so much easier. It, you know, it's like... Um, it's a little bit more work on the front end to educate ourselves into what compounds are in the things that we're infusing, but it's just so much easier once you understand that. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah, I find when I'm doing anything, it's just understanding what it is that I want to break down. And I always base it off of water content or sugar content or acidity um, to try and understand like how I can best put it into a cocktail. Um, let me just... Can you, um, just to review, that was uh, sodium metabisulfite, right? Is sodium was the metabisulfite. It's a food stabilizer additive, and for like a thousand milliliters, you just have to add like ten grams. So, and it works really well. It keeps everything really bright green. Um, you can do this with syrups, like I said. Um, when I worked with Luis Hernandez, we did um, a celery-based syrup. So we like blitzed it with celery, added the sodium metabisulfite, and it was able to remain bright green and delightful. And ideally, you would add the sodium metabisulfite into the solution before you blitzed it so that it would stabilize the color and it wouldn't oxidize, and then you would try and stabilize it. Um, yeah. And, and then can you also explain what, what uh, Pactinex is for the people who don't don't know what pectinex is? So pectinex is, so pectinex is different than pectin, even though they both have that like base word pectin in it. Pectin is naturally found in fruit. Um, and that typically, 
provides a lot of structure and kind of like a, the, the cell structure. Um, so pectin X actually is slightly related, but not, it dissolves cell walls. And so if you're adding pectin X into, um, into say your slurry of papaya and rum, right? So the pectin X is going to dissolve the cell walls of the papaya. And as I said before, when we're thinking of diffusion, like you have, you have your molecule or your item or the structure of whatever fruit you're using, so my papaya, and then you have the alcohol solution that it's suspended in. And so diffusion, typically you're trying to get some of the water content from inside that cell wall out into your alcohol solution. If you're using pectin X, it eats the cell wall. And so it's dissolving, well, not dissolving, but it eats the cell wall that's surrounding all of, like, if I'm using greens, it's the chlorophyll, but it eats the cell wall. And so all of the, the water, natural occurring water content that contain all of those flavors um, will, will move into the solution without having to go through a diffusion process. And so you're able to get like really bright flavors, but you're able to get a very clean texture. So it's kind of like you have the texture of drinking water, um, but you you have tons of flavor. Um, it's really delightful. We have a, a peach hustino that we use at um, Mace, and I would love like if I have a moment, I can run and grab it to you, and you can see how clear it is. Absolutely. You talk for a minute. All right. Yeah, I wonder what I'll do to fill the air. <laughs> um, pe pe pectin X, uh, in, in short, um, is breaking down pectin. And pectin is uh, commonly uh, found in, in stone fruits. If you think about um, uh, that, uh, that textural element that Dorothy's talking about, it'll make a lot more sense. Um, Nick's asking if there's a good source to, to learn about additives and stabilizers. I actually haven't read Liquid Intelligence. I just know it exists. I'm a very bad reader. Um, but uh, uh, Dave Arnold uh, would, would definitely be a great source. Uh, and Dave Arnold's book, which is Liquid Intelligence, would be a good source. But do you have any other ones, Dorothy? Um, the Alex Day's new book did a fantastic job. Uh, Dave Arnold kind of set a really great foundation in terms of applying modern like molecular gastronomy and innovative food techniques into the drink setting. Great foundation, it is slightly dated. And so Alice's Day's book that he just had come out, um, a little bit more on like ratios of balancing flavors, his is really fantastic. Um, I've always used, I've always been working with chefs. So a lot of my resources come from working with pastry chefs and people with culinary degrees. And um, yeah, I don't know if there's like a great book, but if you, looked into more of a culinary sense. The Modernist Pantry has some really great like small articles if you wanted to reference them. Um, they also provide, like you can order a lot of the stabilizers or pectin X or different chemical elements that you'd want to add or use or play with. They sell them directly and so you can go to their website and check it out. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I just have bought a lot of their stuff over the years. Uh. There's also, uh, I was going to say, there's also um, uh, books that, that, uh, that I've always been referred to by chefs. So chefs are, are a great, great resource. Um, but the modernist uh, cuisine books, um, which are, are a little bit expensive, uh, but they're the, the um, they're, I think there's just five different chapters. Um, but uh, I, would, I would go Google them and, and pick them up. I, I remember when I was still bartending, I would, I would go in there and, and teach myself a lot about things like sous vide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, oh, what I wanted to show you with the right. clarifying. So this is, this is actually kind of cloudy, but it's still pretty transparent. So this was just pureed peaches. Um, so ideally, if you're just pureeing peaches, it's gonna be super thick. Um, but this is actually pretty clear. Um, as you can see, you can kind of see through the others. Well, maybe the lighting here kind of sucks. Let me. You can tell. Yeah, let's put it in a different glass. Yeah, you can see right there. It's pretty clear. Wow. And so this is kind of the result that you would get from using pectin X. Um, 
Sometimes if you have issues getting Pectinex, we'll do Cheetosan and Ketosol, which is like a two-step process. We have to do the one, let it sit for 15 minutes, and then finish with the other, let it sit for a half hour. But that's the same thing. Um, just back to the sodium metabisulfite for, for, for a second. Um, now that everyone, I, I guess Matt has actually instantly gone on to Amazon and ordered some. Um, so he wants, <laughs> he wants to know, uh, he, he, he would like to know, and so would I, um, how much we should be putting in, 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 in our solutions or if there's a proper ratio. I do 10 grams per um, thousand milliliters typically, um, but that's dependent about how much green you're incorporating into it and how much chlorophyll is present. Like if you're doing celery, you would do slightly less than if you have something with more, like a higher concentration of chlorophyll, like a leaf. So play around with it. Awesome. I love it. We're learning so much. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Oh, no. See, this is why we can't do cocktail conferences without you, Dorothy. <laughs> I feel so honored. Okay. okay. So moving forward into what we would do with the sous vide. If anyone hasn't played with the sous vide before, really, sous vide is kind of the brand name. What it is is an immersion circulator. And I have one out here. Just hang out. Ooh. You should see like how the bar is set up. It's a mess. It's just like a lineup of one thing after another. It looks like a train wreck. <laughs> so, immersion circulator is something that sits in a water bath. Um, you may have seen some advertisements for it. They're like really big on steaks, or people use them to make meat, like meaty dishes. Um, there are some typical like HESAP regulations in terms of regulating your temperature if you're using them. But that has to do if you are backslaying them traditionally. Um, but I'm not sure what the regulations are in Canada from a food safety standpoint, but it's fun. So it is a water bath. So in here I have a just a typical pambrel of water. Um, this is set pretty high. Um, I think this is at like 70 degrees C. Um, and this is the immersion circulator. So how it works is it has a small little fan at the bottom. So as you can see, let's see, let's see it. the water is actually moving in the solution. And so the fan will move and it will heat up the water and it will stabilize the temperature. So if I'm making any syrups or anything like that, I'll typically throw them in here. We'll keep it at a stable temperature um, and it will not cook, but it'll facilitate the diffusion process rapidly. Um, I had a little issue with some of my syrups. I like came from like Cape May area up to New York, which is a little like two and a half, three hours. And some of my syrups exploded in the trunk of my car. Exploded? <laughs> it was gross. So I don't have them oh, right no. now. Um, but you have your immersion circulator. Ideally on top, you set your temperature. Some immersion circulators like this one, this is from PolyScience. Like back when I first started using these, these were like 700 bucks a pop, um, US dollars. Now, fortunately, you can get a lot of them for cheaper. You're looking at, you get some for $70 to 100. I'm gonna tell you the nifty thing where you're thinking of like, do I get an expensive one? Do I get a cheap one? They're all going to break, get a cheap one. And this was one of my chef friends told me that. And she's like, it doesn't matter. They're all going to break. Why am I going to spend my money on an expensive one if I can get a cheap one? And it's going to pretty much last the same that time. I know you say like, but it's worth more money or it's from a better brand or it may have a warranty. I'm going to tell you, uh, throughout me using these, I have probably seen maybe like two dozen die. And I own several simply because I just never know when it's going to die on me. Like they're always kind of falling apart, but I find them very, very useful. So we have a water bath. We have our temperature setting. Um, typically they'll have a timer, but what does this have to do with cocktails? And so my big thing is, is when we're talking about the diffusion process of trying to infuse things. So we had pressure like with our ISI, we use the blender where we applied kinetic energy. When we're using our sous vide or the immersion circulator, what we're doing is we're applying heat. And so when you're thinking of we're applying heat, we're increasing the kinetic energy 
and so the molecules are moving rapidly. Um, if I'm using a syrup, traditionally, this is my number one go-to way to make a syrup. And if you're at home bartending, this is the best way to play around with things and the best way to ultimately harness flavor and like capture the season. So as I was saying before, I wanted to capture my fresh watermelon, which tastes really great right now. So when we're thinking of syrups, I'm not adding any water to them. If we're thinking about high water concentrated items like watermelon, strawberry, cantaloupe, I'm taking that fruit, I'm tossing it in sugar, I'm throwing it in a little bag. These are little reusable bags, but you can use a Ziploc bag. If you're fancy, you can use your vacuum sealer, but at the end of the day, you're throwing them in. If I am taking them, I'm putting my ingredients in. This one seals really tight. I put my ingredients in, so I have my watermelon and my sugar, and we'll talk about ratios of those in a moment. And then ideally I submerge them in water. So if you're not doing a vacuum seal, you, if you don't like push it into the water and get some of the air out, you'll be left with a big like floating balloon that will just bop around. And if there's too much air as the air heats up, your container might open and it'll make a mess. So from this setting, since this is open, as we can see, I'm gonna push it down into the water until the very tip is on top and then I'm going to seal it. So it's not a vacuum seal, but what it will is get a lot of that surrounding air out of the bag. And when I'm thinking of how I want to in, like get the flavors across, this allows, if I'm doing my watermelon, my sugar, like my previous example, it allows the heat of the water to move directly into your bag without any air buffering it. This allows the water content within your fruit so your watermelon, your apple, your strawberry to diffuse directly into your sugar. And so when that happens, you have some sugar that moves into your fruit. And from there, you'll have water that gets released out. I'm sure we've all done the thing where you have like some strawberries on the counter, you toss them in a little sugar. And like after like five, 10 minutes, you're left with some liquid at the bottom. Or if you just have fresh cut watermelon that you pick up from the store and you have some like juices that are sipped out the bottom. So what this does, it facilitates the water extraction from outside, from inside the fruit to outside. And this is best seen in um, your syrup making. So the best thing is, is that since it's an enclosed setting and I removed almost all of the air, I mean, there's still a little bit here because it's not a vacuum seal. It prevents, it allows the, the water content from within the fruit to diffuse outward without it oxidizing rapidly. So if I had my fruit just sitting out, like a cold process syrup, like you would traditionally do, where I'd have my strawberries tossed in sugar and let it sit, um, the strawberries would be rapidly oxidizing from the air surrounding it. On this one, there's very little surrounding air, so you don't have the oxidation happening. Um, I do this for all of my syrups because after you do this extraction, and please do this, this is my favorite thing. It's the best way to do it. If you're using honeydew or pineapple, apples, anything across the board, you will get fruit that tastes like you're biting into it. Um, now when you're thinking of temperatures, the big thing is, is that we're not trying to cook. So if my temperature is too high and say, I put my apple in, even if it's vacuum sealed, my apple will brown because it's actually cooking and browning and there's a Maillard reaction happening. Um, I'm not trying to denature those proteins. When you think of denaturing, that's when the, like, the proteins start to unravel because they're cooking. Um, I typically keep my temperature for my fruit syrups relatively low. So I'm looking at somewhere between like 50 and 60 degrees C, um, nothing too high. So in um, empirical, I keep them all around like 105, 110. Um, and kind of depend upon what I'm using. Sorry, I don't have the AC on here and it's hot. I don't oh, know. it's all good. I'm like hot right now. I can't see <laughs> it. seems much. All right. But moving on to this, um, I lost my train of thought because I was like, oh, I've got sweat dripping down my neck. And it's funny because we're on Zoom, so we can't even tell. <laughs> <laughs> Everything looks great. I have a, I, I'll, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll swing you back through into it with a, with, with a few questions. Okay. Um, can I use, uh, well, first of all, is air that bad? Like the difference between a va vacuum sealers can be fairly expensive. 
right? So, so that Ziploc technique, and I, I love that technique. It, it can actually save a lot of money. And plus you can reuse the bags and everyone likes sustainability, right? Well, who doesn't? Yeah. Um, um, on that note, backpacks are great because you can apply pressure to them. Um, I liked using them when I had access to them. Um, depending on the U.S. Health Department thing is varied from state to state. Some states have no regulations on vacuum sealing. Other states, like New York, have really high regulations. And so to get access to it, it's like ten to $20,000 a fee in addition to like buying the machine and getting the licensing in place. Um, so I think the Ziploc technique, like, I will traditionally double bag it. Like I'll put it in once and then put it in, put it in a second one and try and force the air out. Um, you don't want the air, especially if you're doing a Ziploc or a sealed bag technique, simply because the air is heating, the air is heating up and it could pop your bag. And it could like you're, I've done this before several times or where like, oh, I'm making a bell pepper infused mezcal and suddenly I walk into the room, the whole place smells like mezcal and peppers and I'm like, crap, my bag broke. Yeah. And it's kind of a waste of materials. So from that standpoint, you want to close it down. Secondly, since you want to facilitate diffusion in the most efficient manner, um, you think about putting your hand in a pot of boiling water, like you're going to burn your hand. Versus if you put your hand in a stove, like you're not gonna get burned immediately unless you like touch something. And that's because like water is a better, transfers heat a lot better than air does. And so if you're trying to facilitate infusion in an efficient manner without oxidation, you wanna kind of get all that air out. Um, and so I talked about temperature. So we wanna keep the temperature on the lower side. Um, if you have the temperature too high where it starts cooking the fruit, your syrups are going to taste super gross. You may think like, let me crank up the heat, let me go faster. But if you're doing a cantaloupe syrup and you cook it, your, your end product's going to taste like burnt squash and, or it'll get kind of gnarly. Um, and you're not going to get the flavors that you want. Unless you want something weird, go for it. <laughs> you um, never know. <laughs> or if you're trying to blacken it, so you want that Maillard reaction. Maillard being when you have something brown, like you have a banana out and it browns, or you're like cooking meat and it browns. Um, you can run it at a high temperature for a long time, like several days, to facilitate kind of that de um, decomposition process. If you want it to go more of that like fermentation and funky flavored route. The regulations on that are a little bit tricky, but like I've done it when I was working for Mr. Lion, did it with banana peels and banana, we did it with banana flesh um, and a little bit of sugar to cure them. And we did that for like a th for three days and they would be blackened and we'd make a syrup out of it. Hmm. Um, but it was when we, since we're in America, it was kind of one of those like, ooh, don't tell anybody, let's hide it in the corner. Yeah. Um, um, now breaking it down into applicable ratios for you to use this. So I talked about, you can do this with um, your fresh fruit and sugar and get really delicious, bright, vibrant syrups. Um, when you're thinking of your ratios, you wanna break it down by the water content of the fruit that you're using. So for example, high water content fruit, your watermelon, your strawberry, your melons. I always do um, like a thousand grams of my fruit to like 900 grams of sugar. So it's slightly off because those fruit have about like a 90%, um, 90%, they're 90% water. But then as I'm moving down and say I'm using my apple or I'm doing things like pineapple, which has a little bit more shell structure and a little bit more fiber for those apples, I'm using like maybe for the same thousand grams of apples, I'm using only 500 grams of sugar, simply because the water content is so different and the yield is going to be completely different. Um, now, when you're thinking of consistency and how you would have your, your syrup from one batch to the next, because every fruit's different and you're gonna have a different yield of water content to sugar, um, a really handy tool is a refractometer. So this measures the bricks level or the total um, it's like the sugar concentration by volume of what you're doing. So a traditional one-to-one -one simple will be about 50, a two-to-one simple will be in the 60s. And so if you're making your syrup 
you primarily want to focus on getting the maximum extraction of that water content out of the fruit. And then you can always add a little bit of extra sugar later. And these are super easy. You can just take, pop these guys open. And this is a little bit of like turbinado um, sugar syrup or demerara. Ooh, that was too much. <laughs> That's why it's sticky. <laughs> All right. So um, for these things, you just typically just shine them into light. They do have electronic ones. They're a little bit more expensive. These guys are like 20 bucks. And then you just kind of like show it into the light. Like the bricks on this one is around 70. And I mean, Mace does their Demerara syrups a little bit of a higher concentration. So that's, that makes sense. Um, and so if I'm testing out my sugar syrups that I'm making at home, you can check out your bricks. Um, another useful application for these little guys on the refractometers, or if you're ever doing slushy drinks um, and you have your slushy machines, you can check your bricks out because um, when you're doing slushies, you want to make a hydro, um, hydrocolloid where you have like a suspension between a liquid and a solid. Um, and if you've ever tried to like freeze sugar, it gets kind of slushy in addition to the fact that, or not freeze sugar, but freeze a simple syrup. It, it's not going to freeze into a solid. You'll get a little bit slush because sugar doesn't have the same freezing point as, I mean like a sugar solution doesn't have the same freezing point as water does. Um, you're able to like monitor your slushies and create monitor your bricks to create a consistent product. Um, I'm just gonna clean this off. Really That's quick. an awesome trick. So, um, so with that being said, can we use like like have you ever used frozen fruit instead of fresh fruit? So the thing with frozen fruit is, so I don't use them in this application because when you think of we have a frozen fruit and then you let it come to room temperature, that cell structure is just a mess. Like it's all mushy. Um, and you're not gonna have that same bright flavor. Like flash freezing or freezing your fruit kind of like destroys some of your cell structure. So after you're trying to like diffuse out and get those flavors later, those cells, like that water content that you want with all of those like volatile esters that carry um, flavor and aromatics are gonna be slightly damaged. So you're not gonna get the same flavor. My typical approach is um, I say about taking a snapshot of the seasons is to when it's in season, make a batshit amount of whatever you're trying to do. Um, make enough and all that you need. And then after you fine strain it off, you can just freeze them because you have all the solids out and now you're just left with the liquids and the sugar um, and it's not really going to go bad. So you can totally freeze it. Right, that makes sense. Can you also talk about um, uh, surface area and how important surface area is when it's being, when, it, when it's in a solution and, and how to maximize flavor that way? Yes, so surface area is also really important. Um, if I'm doing my infusion, so kind of taking a step away from syrups, but this still applies to um, how I would make, say my bell pepper mezcal, which I love to make. Um, what I'm going to do is I wanna maximize the surface area of what I'm cutting up. So in this case, it's my bell peppers. If I just take a whole bell pepper and like throw it into the solution, it's not going to have that much of a yield. Like it's, you have the outside, but you're kind of preventing from the inside. So I'm going to chop it up as fine as possible. Same as if I'm going for my, if I'm doing something with watermelon or if I want to do something with cantaloupe, I want to chop it up and kind of into very fine uniform squares. Um, I typically do a little bit more, maybe like two centimeters by two centimeters. Um, I think that's a good process. Um, if they're too large, the problem is, is that you're not going to get Get a full diffusion. What you want to do is you want to get a ma the maximum capability and diffusion of that flavor outward. And to do that, you want to maximize your surface area. So you want to be cognizant of how you're chopping it up. Um, and with that, there are other fun things that you can do um, in terms of being very cost effective. So say I'm making my pineapple syrup and I've chopped up everything and it's very fine. Um, what you can also do is I will traditionally, when I'm cutting it, I'll also in a separate container, I'll actually also back seal some of the skins, not back seal, but I'll seal some of the skins and a little bit of sugar and make a different syrup from the skins um, to get a little bit more of like a rustic and vegetal note. Vegetal note. Um, 
And especially with after you're doing your fruit and after you strain everything off, it may seem like, oh, well, I've wasted all my fruit. This is something that will turn you into like a gem. I always make a pie out of it. Like maybe not with watermelon and cantaloupe, but I just did this with a bunch of like strawberries. I did a blueberry syrup and some raspberry syrup. I took all of them, tossed them with some fresh lemons and like made a crumble. Um, and that was a hit. So there is a way, or you can blend it up and make some fruit leather if you have a dehydrator or, and like cut those into some fun garnishes. So your waste and your runoff from this doesn't have to get directly thrown in the trash. Um, after you find strain everything off, you can actually utilize it in a separate source. So if you are the home bartender and say you want to make um, a plum rum, you can take your plum rum, which actually sounds kind of fun. Um, it does. <laughs> wrap it up, have it thrown in, let it infuse into your rum, and um, especially in your solution. And after it's done, I'll strain everything off, and then I can take my rum, I can add some sugar, I can make a jam, or I can turn it into another pastry. Uh, I, it was really fun when I worked with different pastry chefs. They would I would take what they were using and they would use my leftovers and like trying to create like a really nice 360 element where we're using each other's waste. Um, yeah. Did I talk about the ratios of water content to sugar? Yes, I did, right? Yes. Did we? Yeah, I think so. I've been, um, and someone uh, let us know on the chat bar board if we have it. And definitely, de definitely keep asking questions. Um, uh, just, just one more question that I have on, uh, on, on sous vide stuff. Um, say I don't have the necessary materials at home. Could I possibly use mason jars and just like an induction burner? Would that be, would that be effective? So if you have, if you're able to regulate your temperature and what you're using is tempered, like you can, you can do things. I like, I've done things in a water bath where I didn't have access to a sous vide. When I was doing the cocktails for Camp Runamuck, I was on their Bev team and I was like, oh, we should be sous vide this. Why didn't I bring a sous vide? And I got a giant pot on an induction burner where you can like set your temperature and let yeah. it run. I set it at the appropriate temperature that I would want, let the water bath come up and I threw everything in Ziploc bags and I was like, cool, miss, these will be done in a few hours. And um, I don't think I talked about our, like amount, the amount of time. So traditionally we were talking about the like room temperature diffusion infusions that you traditionally see, um, those can take several days. For these, if you're looking at something that's more porous, like your honey to your cantaloupe, et cetera, um, especially in syrups, those can be done in about five hours. Um, if you're trying to blacken things, those can, come, those can take several days. If you are trying to infuse something, so like infuse your liquor or you're trying to make a cordial of some sort or a liqueur for your bar. Um, with those kinds of flavors, you typically, typically you'll get maximum dilution uh, in the flavor that you want around six hours. Um, and especially if you're making your syrup, the fun thing is that since you're, if you're using the bags, um, you and if there's some sugar in the corners, you can actually move them and dissolve the sugar um, to kind of like apply a little bit of energy and get it into the solution. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the things you can do with an induction burner too, it's, it's, uh, it's great. There's, um, th there's another question here. Would you, so when you're making your syrup um, infusions using a sous vide method, would you ever use actual simple syrup and then put it into a bag with say watermelon or would you just use sugar? Would that be too much water content? So when we're thinking of diffusion, if you have water already in the solution, it's gonna prevent water from inside the fruit diffusing out. Cause you wanna think of it as a concentration base. Um, I think the best thing is, is the more difference you have on either side, the more extraction you're going to get. Um, an example would be like, if I'm in my apartment and I'm nice and toasty and it's a blizzard outside and I open my window, that cold air is gonna rush in and the heat from my apartment is going to rush out. That, because it's an extreme versus if I'm open the window and it's the same temperature on each side, there's not gonna be that rush of energy flowing back and forth. The same applies if you're thinking about something and so wanting to make your syrup. So if I have a high concentration of water in my watermelon, 
and just straight up sugar, you're gonna get the maximum amount of water diffusing out into that sugar. If I take my watermelon and I throw it in a simple syrup, there's already a water content present. And so you're not gonna get the maximum amount of water from that watermelon. And when we think of the water that's in there, that's the like, water's a solvent. Those are, that's carrying all of the flavors that you want to enhance. And if you are creating something that already has water in it, you're not gonna get that maximum flavor. It's going to just be more watered down. Mm. It's really, you're not gonna get the best yield. Are there different, are, are there, for your diffusions, are there different kinds of sugar that are better than others? Or is that just a matter of flavor? Matter of flavor, but also I typically stick with granulated or the fine grain. If you have something that has a little bit too large of a grain, um, like say your rock, like the thick, like sugar in the raw, you're gonna have a little bit of a harder time getting those sugar crystals to dissolve. It's totally possible and you can, but you need to apply more energy to it. Um, I traditionally stick with fine granulated. Awesome. Um, and, and Jeff uh, uh, has a question. Is that why oleosaccharum works so well with citrus? Because you're drawing that water out. Is that the same science? So it's the same science, but it's a different application. So with citrus peels and oleosaccharum, we're actually talking about oil content. So oleosaccharum is an oil sugar. So what we're happening is, is rather than the diffusion happening of water content, it's actually the oil content from within the citrus peels. So yeah. if we, um, like we've all made an old fashioned and we've zested the orange oils over the top. And we, why do we do that? We like it because the oils carry all of these really great aromatics. Now when I'm doing an oleosaccharum, there is no oil in my sugar that surrounds those citrus peels. And if anyone doesn't know what an oleosaccharum is, it's traditionally right. a whole bunch of citrus peels tossed in sugar, you let them toss, you let them sit overnight, and then you're left with this like ooey gooey, great aromatic citrus goodness that you can either like cook into a syrup or make a sherbet into. A sher sherbet into. Um, I love doing them, they're fantastic. Um, but with those, you have a transfer of the oil from inside your, your citrus peel outward into your sugar solution. So it's not water content. It's more mm -hmm. of the oil that carries those aromatics. There is some, but it's primarily the oils that you have coming out. And that's why it's called an oil sugar. Um, also, a note onto that. Um, that oleosaccharums, I find, are the one use where the sous vide doesn't traditionally work. So it doesn't really rapidly do them. I will typically like seal them into back bags at just for storage prop purposes, but I haven't found that if I throw them in the sous vide, they go that much faster. Um, I think the biggest difference you can do is maximizing your surface area. So microplaning versus just doing the full on zest with the Y peeler, that's, that's the best way you can go about troubleshooting. But the oil, the oleosaccharum is the one means where I haven't been able to find a way to make it go faster. Mm, that's uh, interesting. That's a that's a really good tip. Uh, exciting. We're learning. We're learning so much. I know I can say one 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 personal thing. Just messing around. I've had, I'm so grateful that I've been able to have a lot of these tools when I was bartending. But um, tea uh, is awesome um, in um, in 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 uh, vac seal bags or in these Ziploc bags. Uh, because by controlling the temperature, uh, you can also control the amount of tannins. Um, and so it's, it's always, it's been really, really useful, at least for me. What else do we got? On, on that note, oh, yeah. tea, anything like that. So I've been talking primarily about using fruit. When you're using like tea or spices in a sous vide setting, especially if they're like already ground, or if you're using tea, so tea high in tannin, tea already wants to dissolve. You're not going to cook this for five or six hours. Like, you throw it in the sous vide with your herbs. Right. Like, it's done in like 30 minutes, if not slightly faster. Like, this is something that rather than having your like tea bag sit in your alcohol solution for a day or however long you typically takes for it to diffuse, um, instead, it's something that you can just get done in like 20 minutes. It's super fast. Um, if you're doing spices, it's just going to be a couple hours. Things to note with spices if you have like whole allspice berries that's not very, not the most efficient way to go about doing it. Ideally, like powdered spices, because of their higher surface area, you're gonna get the best yield on how you integrate them. And um, some people don't like using powdered spices. 
I traditionally use a spice grinder. Spice grinders can be kind of expensive, but if not, I use like a cheap little coffee, like coffee blender or coffee grinder, coffee grinder. Yeah, coffee grinder. Uh, those you can get for about 15 bucks or $10 on Amazon. And those, um, you can blitz up your spices, so your fresh allspice, your vanilla bean, a lot of those other things. And you don't have to necessarily buy a spice blender, a uh, spice grinder, or if you have your, um, if you have a Vitamix and you have access to it, that's a high speed of a blender and you can get most of that done as well in there. So yeah, that's an awesome point. That's an awesome point on, on uh, time, right? Cause uh, t uh, definitely time changes everything. Um, the, the quick question, just back on oleo for a second. Do you have a, a, a set ratio for sugar to, to citrus peels? Uh, someone asked and I always challenge myself with that too. Um, so I do most of my ratios out of like a thousand. Um, so for a thousand grams of sugar, I typically do between two and 300, depending on the, 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 like what the peels are. Um, and if I'm doing that oleo with an additional fruit, um, if I'm doing an additional fruit, I'll do about 250 grams of, of the citrus peels to a thousand grams of sugar and I think it's like 200 grams of fruits. I do like a raspberry lime oleo mm. that I like to do um, but if it's just citrus peels between two and three hundred um, also make sure that if you're doing your zest keep the pith so the white part of the peel out of it. Um, cool. It's great to measure things by weight makes things a lot easier and right so you can think yeah. four to one. Um, my big thing is when measuring things by weight, it's all about like consistency because if I'm measuring things by volume, specifically if it's like I'm measuring mill, like if I'm filling this up with fresh fruit and throwing it in, like there's going to be pockets of air in here and it's going to have a different, make a different yield overall. Um, if you're trying to create more scientific processes behind your bar setting, um, yeah, use it, use a scale. If you're the home bartender, though, I won't fault you if you eyeball it a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to incorporate all these awesome techniques into into our eyeball cocktails, I suppose. So, yeah. Ryan, Ryan has a question. Um, uh, would you still try uh, toasting the spices uh, before using them to enhance the flavor, or if you if you just use powdered ones, it, it is render is is the toasting <laughs> useless? Like yeah. whatever flavor you want to get, like if you like the flavor of toasted spices and then say you want to grind them up a little and then incorporate it, go for it. We have mm. to think that the material you put in is the flavor that you're going to get out. So if you like that flavor, like for example, if I want caramelized bananas and I take them and caramelize them and then try and incorporate that into a syrup, I'm going to get caramelized bananas. Versus if I take an unripe banana and I start with that, my flavor is going to yield unripe bananas. Right. So. However you manipulate your flavor from the get-go and whichever process you take, like those are the flavors you're going to get out of it. So yes, you can totally toast it, go for it. Amazing. So do you have, do you have any more, uh, uh, do you have another demo? Yes, I was gonna do a little carbonation demo if that was cool. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm so sorry, I'm like, Chatty, chatty with my no, friends. no, no, no. It's 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 great, and and uh, I mean we normally run these around ninety minutes or so, but I feel like it's it's great to go over time. I see Matt uh, is cozying up by a fire for some reason. He needs, oh my God. He needs to have a fire at I'm the end of June, uh, in, only in Canada. It's um, <laughs> more of an You need heat, and then also I just wanted to showcase uh, Atlantic Canada. If you want to come hang out here, it's always cozy. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that I'm so down. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. It's cold where he is, apparently. Um, I'm kidding. I am like sweltering hot New York summer. You know, you know, if anyone knows anything about New York summers, it is uh, gross. Um, fortunately, there's a pandemic, so I don't have to go into the subways, but the, sub the train stations in the summer are an experience. <laughs> oh, and with all the people in there too, my goodness. Body oh, oh. Oh. Well, I have all the, the hot summer sun for you. <laughs> I love New York, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Ringing endorsement. Carbonation. <laughs> so as I mentioned before, I mentioned like soda sites and things like that when I was talking about the ISI. 
Um, technically, you can carbonate in an ISI. Just check and make sure you can use carbon dioxide in it. When I was talking about the NO2 gas that you typically use when we're doing the infusions, um, that one's going to be pressure based. Carbon dioxide works completely different. Um, carbon dioxide works from um, this is this is going to be a fun flashback to physics. Who mm. took physics? Is all about partial pressure. And so, um, if we have our fun little vessel, which I have here, um, partial pressure is essentially kind of very similar to diffusion, where you have like something separating two, in which case we have water, and the other one air, and you introduce carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide just wants to reach neat equilibrium on both spaces. So you want the same amount of carbon dioxide in the head space, so the air, that you do in the water. The carbon dioxide does not dissolve into the water like some people believe. Like it's not bonding to the water. Carbon dioxide is one of those things where it just wants to pack in. Um, it's one of those elements where it's not going to bond to the H2O molecules and the alcohol. It's not going to play like very minimal interaction with the alcohol. The carbon dioxide is just trying to be in the solution, so in the liquid and also in the space. So when I add my carbon dioxide into my vessel, in this case I've got this fun soda can, um, I'm going to add my carbon dioxide. And so the carbon dioxide isn't going to stay in this head space. It's going to diffuse right into my liquid. And then what's in my liquid, there's always suspended gases in the liquid, whether there's some oxygen or anything else, like any atmospheric gases, they'll get pushed back up until there's the same amount of carbon dioxide molecules on this part in the top than they're in at the bottom. And so when I'm carbonating, it's all about one, getting the existing atmospheric air particles that are in the H2O. And you always see them. You can kind of see like little cloudiness or little like air bubbles. Um, the first step is going to be to flush out the at any atmospheric air that is suspended in the solution. So any other gases. And so then you'll, you'll pump it full of gas and release it. Um, the second step is you're going to put more in. As you add more in, you've already got some CO2 in solution now. Now you have more up top. More CO2 is going to go from the top into the bottom. I'm going to shake it. So this is kind of like maximizing the surface area, getting the most amount of CO2 that's in that headspace in, in contact with the water, with my solution at the bottom. And so then I'll release it. And why am I releasing it? Simply so that I can keep adding more CO2 into the solution. So I'll have CO2 up top. The more CO2 gets dissolved into the bottom until they're at equal levels. Then I'm going to add more into the top so that more gets moved into the bottom. They're not dissolving. Really, it's all about getting an equilibrium of CO2 molecules. Fun fact, if you're trying to carbonate, your liquid has to be cold. Um, it's not going to work if it's hot. Uh, what you want is you want nice, cold, chilled, little to no kinetic energy, simply so the molecules can move back and forth. Additionally, because when you're thinking of my allusion to having a window with hot and cold air, you're adding gas in, the gas is not cold, then you have a cold solution, the CO2 is going to want to automatically move into, the, they're going to want to automatically move in. Um, so that's handy and fun. The temperature, the changes in temperature and the low temperature facilitates carbon dioxide moving to the solution faster and upping your total amount of partial pressure, being the amount of pressure on each side. So that was physics for the day. Wasn't that fun? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's very useful. You, 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 when you understand these concepts, like it, it becomes a lot easier to actually execute them, right? I have a lot of people, well, initially I like, people were talking about carbonating and they're like, oh yeah, we need to dissolve the carbon dioxide into solution. And I was like, does carbon dioxide dissolve into water? And like, all I do is think for a few seconds. And I was like, no, it doesn't. And then you like look into how carbon dioxide works. And like, it's not about like, I could keep putting in carbon dioxide and I can shake the crap out of it after one charge, but I'm not going to get nice tight bubbles because I haven't released any of the gas that, sh that was previously suspended in the solution. So I have to get that out first. And then as you're shaking it, you want to make sure you're like releasing it several times simply so that you can get the maximum amount of carbon dioxide in. Um, so looking at this vessel, as I said before, you can do this in a soda siphon. Um, 
in which case you would charge it several times like we do for the nitrogen gas, but it would be a charge, then release, then a charge. Um, this is handy if anyone's worked with these behind the bar. Um, these are like little taps that you can screw on top of a soda can. Um, it has a little bit of a valve here, and this is actually a ball lock. If anyone's a home brewer or knows anything about like brewery and corny kegs, um, these are super handy. So these will allow you to attach it to a lock. Um, Oh, I hope there's gas in here. We'll throw this right there for a second. I'm like right over a bar station, so this is. Um, this this one's for the garage. <laughs> garage or the industrial soda maker. Um, and ultimately, this is what we're doing if we're using one of those like soda streams. Right. Um, this is more of a like this is what I have access to at Mace. Um, or even if you're thinking about you have a bar and you want to do some like draft cocktails or if you are just Someone who likes to throw a party Post socially distant party and you want to like keg a cocktail and carbonate it and have it like I personally if I'm doing an event um, Or having friends over I always have like a keg cocktail that sits in my fridge mm. and pour it off. All right So as we noticed before we have this little lock this guy It'll force the gas in. And what I have here is there's different styles of locks. This is a ball lock. Um, and there's another one with a pin lock that kind of has, has like little grooves in the top. Um, and these will traditionally be attached to a long line that you can use for a gas tank. Not all the gas tanks are this big. Um, this is a larger one because we use this in a restaurant setting. Um, you can get smaller ones that are like this big um, if you're using them at home. Let me make sure this thing's on, honestly. I love it. Stefan is uh, is indicating that he has one one of these setups in his one bedroom home. So, uh, <laughs> you, Stefan, is it Stefan? Yeah. Yeah. Five gold stars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is <laughs> that. That's home mixology, Stefan. I love it. <laughs> okay, you know what? I have a brief suspicion that someone at Mace left this open and did may have released all the gas. Oh no. In which case, I love you, but I'll just demo. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so crap. Okay, it is on, awesome. So it was just never turned off. All right. So now back to the demo. Thank you for being patient with that. Oh. So as I, like, there's already some air up here. And in this, I just have like gin and tonic solution. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push this out. So we wanna get the maximum amount of carbon dioxide into the solution. So I'm gonna just push it down, as you can see. Primarily because if I create less space for the existing air, I'm gonna allow more space for the carbon dioxide to get added. Um, I'm gonna screw on my top. And then I'm going to push this on. Hopefully you said you can get those at like home brewer stores, right? Yeah, or you can get it on Amazon for like under $10. Awesome. Like you can the locks, the locks, the threads, and the top. Um, it's pretty cheap. I mean, the most you'll pay for is this. And you can get these. I've gotten these used before for about $20. Um, so as you can see, I've filled it up. You can see that there's gas in there. I'm going to shake it. So by shaking it, I'm maximizing the surface area that the CO2 is in contact with. Um, and then I'm gonna slowly release it. And so you can already see that there's some gas that's moved into the solution. I'm gonna force it out again and press it. Get my tap on. So when you first did it, you saw some of the bubbles. So that wasn't enough bubble to make it feel carbonated, like if you started drinking it. If you want that like nice hard bubble, you're gonna have to do this a little bit more. Um, pump it up again. And you can definitely hear it and see it. You shake it up. And that's cold, right? Yes, it's cold. This uh, was this was in an ice water bath, but uh, it's not here, so all my ice melted. Uh, so <laughs> So even though there's some still some movement, you can see some of the carbon dioxide moving out back and forth. I'm gonna push it open. I'll do it if 
out one more time. I typically do these at about 40, 40 PSI, um, 40 PSI about three different times. Um, but my liquid has to be cold. And is there, is there a, a, how much liquid is in that uh, bottle? Not very much, maybe like 300 milliliters. Um, you can do these in larger batches. If you're doing this in like a large keg format, mm -hmm. you're just going to have to like keep the pressure high. If I'm doing these for a cock, like a keg and I want nice hard bubbles, I'll actually just keep it on carbonation. Like I'll carbonate the space, shake it up a lot. Like I'll shake it kind of like what I'm doing. Like I'll roll the keg along or if I'm being lazy and just want it consistently, I'll base it off of time. So I'll just keep it connected to the CO2 overnight for a certain amount of hours in the fridge. And that will get me typically my hard bubbles that I want. So about 36, 24 to 36 hours usually. When Matt's asking, when you're making actual uh, keg cocktails, should you be venting um, when, when you're forced carbonating? Um, it depends. If I'm letting it run overnight, I'm not venting it. Um, if I am doing a kegged cocktail and say I'm trying to force carbonate it rapidly, so not via time. So if I have a keg of gin and tonic and you know what, I found it wasn't carbonated and I just blew my other keg of it and I need it on the fly, I will do a series of venting and carbon, like venting, carbonating, shaking the crap out of it aggressively venting, carbonating it again, shaking it aggressive. Like I am talking about like whole big keg, like you are moving it, you're rolling it back and forth. Like you're trying to get more surface area, the CO2 to kind of get that equilibrium faster. Um, you can vent it. If I, most of the corny kegs have a little release valve, mm -hmm. like keep it on pressure. Um, hold on, I actually have one of the lids I can show you. It's sort of funny to listen to what's going on in the background. <laughs> that was a struggle. <laughs> it sounded funny. <laughs> you know what the best thing about me is? I'm very pretentious. <laughs> Um, so the fun thing with these corny kegs, and this is the top, so in a Cornelius keg you have a hole, you have your in and your out output, and this will be the lid um, with a little bit of a seal on, and this will be what you take on and off to put your liquid in. These will have a release valve, so if I keep it on CO2 over, like overnight like I do, um, I had a spritz on at a bar in Soho that I consulted on, and they, um, we just left it on. Um, for about, I think it was 24 to 36 hours, I can't remember. So it says it has a release valve. Um, if there's too much pressure, it's just gonna release and the air will slowly come out. Um, so it's not a closed canister, it's not going to make a bomb. Uh, mm -hmm. But the big thing is, is if you're doing your kegged cocktails and if your release valve is broken and you don't have a release valve, that's really dangerous like super fucking dangerous. Please don't do that. Like, mm. please be wary of this if you wanted to keep it on for a long period of time. Handy note, and I once consulted and helped with draft cocktails for this bar in Midtown, and they didn't realize that you needed to have this release valve on it, and they bought all their kegs secondhand, and they weren't able to manipulate them. They're like, we can't get these off. We don't know what's going on. Um, and they had like, basically little time bombs in their keg fridge. If you ever bump into something where this has popped off and you have a pressurized canister, fun thing is, is that with these ball locks, you can push down on them with like a pen or a knife and release the gas through the valve. This is not like, don't just do this for fun, but in an emergency setting, if you're doing a draft cocktail and something happens to your release valve and you, like the containers can of like empty and pressurized and you can't do anything, please remember that you can just push down on this, your little ball lock right here and release the gas. Let me see if I have a pen I can show you. 
probably like a burr somewhere that's crying, but like mm. you just push down and the gas will come out. Yeah, I could hear it. Yeah. Um, pen might not be the best one, but any sort mm. of like, like, oh, screwdriver. Um, yes. So anyway, I'm shaking this guy up. You can see here now there's tons of bubbles, right? Right. And let me see, let me grab a glass. So this is like, what is it, nightcap? They do this at the bar for just, they use their soda water. Um, you'll be able to see it, there's a little bit of bubbles. Well, this glass isn't good to visualize it, but there are bubbles. I believe you. <laughs> we can right, see the sign. A system like this. I'm going to turn this off now. Um, you can also do similar carbonations with the soda siphon, like one of those old fashioned soda guns. Um, not soda guns, but the soda siphon guns. Um, you can use them like this. Or if you're feeling fancy and want to do something fun at home, you can actually also carbonate with dry ice. Um, So dry ice is not something where I'm like, you've, we've all seen the drinks, which are a huge health violation, just a disaster. We have like a piece of dry ice in the bottom of a drink and someone's drinking out of it. I'm not talking about that. Please don't do that. Um, that's very dangerous. Um, what you can do though, is you can take dry ice and you can put it in kind of like one of those small tea diffuser balls or in any sort of like closed mesh container um, or even in, like a little bit of a like sealed nut milk bag. So something that you can hold it in, but you don't have to worry about chips falling off into your drink. So carbon dioxide is fun because, I mean, dry ice is fun because it's frozen carbon dioxide. And so if you take your dry ice and you put it into solution, you don't want to have a seal on it because there's going to be gas rapidly moving and that would make a bomb. But what no you bombs. can do, <laughs> please don't do that. No bombs. Um, what you can do is you can take a piece of dry ice, put it into your alcoholic solution, and you can just like lightly cover it with like a towel, something very porous. And what will happen is that because of partial pressure, you'll have some of that CO2 moving from a solid state into a gaseous state immediately. And it'll create from the partial pressure as you have carbon dioxide moving into the head space, you have carbon dioxide in the liquid solution and you'll, you can carbonate things that way. Um, not practical in a bar setting, but really festive if you are a home bartender and you're like, ooh, I wanna do something fancy. You can make some like home gin and tonics or carbonated daiquiri, do something nifty. That's actually really cool. And it's a really good tip to use that, that uh, the, the tea ball infuser thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, very safe. I was at a bar in Milan and I was, my like wasted I'd get like not quite blackout white girl wasted definitely white girl wasted and I was meeting up with some other bartenders who were in Asia and one of them was like drinking one of these cocktails and it had like a chunk of dry ice in them and I was like that's fucking dangerous and they're like huh no it's fine because it was like a carbonated drink yeah like, someone swallows that I'll mess you up yeah um I don't know if I have too many other demos. The only other thing I was going to talk about was acid adjusting and using a pH meter. But how are we doing? How are people? Well, we, we're we're um, uh, we're about an hour forty in. Um, but okay, let's wrap it up. But um, but if you do have any other hot hot tips, uh, I'm sure there's an eager audience. I see no one has uh, left the chat room necessarily yet. <laughs> Someone wants to talk. Is down to talk pH. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you have any acid adjusting tips, I think, I mean, I know I would love to hear them. I'm sure everyone else here would, would, would as well. Yeah. So I know we talked about before about like stabilizers and things like that. There's a really hot thing about people trying to like prolong their citrus or even, um, making cordials and they're using kind of powdered acids, especially in New York where people are doing all these canned cocktails. So it's all about like shelf sustainability. Um, you can use powdered cocktails. So this is um, citric acid. Um, this is tartaric. Um, you can get malic, phosphoric. There are these really fun ingredients that you can use 
to either take something that's not acidic, like you can acidify your orange juice. So if you have a lot of fresh oranges because you zest them, but you don't use the juice, you can actually add acid and use it, get it to a pH so you can use it as a lemon or a lime in your drink. Um, so like that level of balance. Um, I don't recommend just like haphazardly throwing acids into it because you can overload it really quickly um, because these little guys pack a punch. Um, there is something really fun called a pH meter and these are super cheap. You can get these for under $10. Um, I'll use these traditional, traditionally if I'm making a cordial or um, like when I worked for Nico the first time um, at, there was at Lavenue and even here, we're always doing acid adjusted um, acid adjusted liquid. So we'll do beet juice, right? Which is not very acidic. Like it's not anywhere close to the acidity of um, like a lemon, which is about a pH of two. You can take your beet juice and create an acid blend, um, however you may like it, and then get it using this little guy to a pH that you'd like. And these are pretty handy. Um, I typically have like the super cheap yellow ones, um, but how these work is you'll have your liquid, whatever it is. And ideally, before you wanna get started, you'll turn it on and you wanna regulate the temperature with a little bit of like distilled water. So distilled water will have a neutral pH, so it'll be at around seven. Um, sorry, I was just checking this out. That's so awesome. this one reads slightly above seven, but, and you can also use these to check the pH of the water that you're currently drinking or at the bar that you're using. I find them pretty fun. But the big thing is, is that you can take your liquid and then you can add your acids to them. I like to do acid blends, which like working with different flavors, you can combine citric with a little bit of tartaric. So tartaric's more of that like fresh green apple. Malik is more of that like floral lime. Um, you can create an acid blend in different portions and kind of like play with flavors. Um, while you're doing that though, it's not like I'm adding like malic and citric and I'm being like, oh, I've got a blend like directly into my container and checking the pH because you want something consistent. I'll traditionally get my scale out and I'll weigh it out. Um, I'll do like, for example, a blend that I like to play is 50% citric, 25 tartaric and 25 malic. Um, Cause I really like the acidity of the green apple. I feel like those acids play really well together. Feel free to scale that blend. I'll just weigh them out in that ratio. So for like 500 grams of citric, I'm adding 250 tartaric, 250 um, malic. That's really large. Like that amount of acid like would last me like months. If you're playing with this at home, you can just do them in like 10 gram increments um, or even like 100 gram. So after I have this and I have my acid blend, you can use your pH meter. You wanna check it and make sure like, okay, it's reading properly, we have neutrality. Then you can take this, check the pH that it is initially. Like if you have pineapple juice and you wanna acidify it, you'll check your pH. So like pineapple juice will be around like four-ish depending on how fresh they are. You'll check it and then you'll slowly add your acid into it. So I will add my acid blend, mix it up several times, try and get it dissolved and then put it in. Thing to note is if you're acid adjusting, you wanna use like a nice shallow container because if I'm measuring the pH and this is a relatively small stick, I mean small vessel. And if I have a really large glass, like for example, if I'm doing it in this quart container and I'm measuring here, but my acids are dissolved down here or they're not totally dissolved, my pH is gonna read differently here than down here. So I'll typically do these in like a shallow pan or even in like a small cup because I can't put this too deep down because it's an electrical element and it'll break. So I'll mix it up, check it, try and get to the pH that I like. As I said before, lemon is about a two, um, vinegar is about a three. I always stick in the like 2.7 range if I'm using an acid blend and I'm taking something that's not acidic and moving it down. Um, and then I find with that 2.5, 2.7 range of a pH, I can then take that after I'm finished. It has a longer shelf life, a longer shelf life because it's acid adjusted and stabilized um, with these additives. And then I can add those into my cocktails with pretty much the same 
same exchange as if I was using like lemon or lime juice. So I can do a cosmopolitan instead of fresh lime juice. I could use my acid adjusted beet or my orange. Um, I can make a daiquiri, but instead of using lime juice, I can do an acid adjusted pineapple. Um, this is a great way to take things that you're using or juices that you have on hand or if there's a fruit that you're using for one purpose, but you're able to get the juice out of it, you're able to get it to an acidity that is actually practical. Because we all know, like being behind a bar, you'll be zesting your oranges and be left with all this orange juice and nobody's ordering a blood and sand. Like nobody's ordering it. So what do you do with all your orange juice? You can turn it into something practical or you can drink it, but that's just, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I get every time we do orange juice and cocktails, I think of Morgenthaler. Um, <laughs> um, do you have a, a, a tip for uh, what ratio of liquid that you should be using to acid blends or is that variant? So it's actually not going to be based off of the total liquid. What we're aiming for is the pH. So the pH is the measurement tool. So what I'm starting with is I'm making a ratio of the different acids. So my acids are separate. Then I have my liquid. And so regardless of what the volume of liquid is, we're not paying attention to the volume or the weight, we're paying attention to the pH. So the pH is the measurement tool. So while we can measure things by PSI for gas, or we're measuring them by weight or by volume, we're measuring by pH. And so as long as the pH for that liquid, like as we're stirring it and making mm -hmm. sure that's consistent, if the pH is measuring what you want, you've, you don't, you might not have to add that much acid or you may have to add a lot. It's all about getting the pH reading that you want. Yeah, it's a good, really good way of thinking of it. And it's a, it's a kind of a paradigm shift, I'm sure, for a lot of bartenders as um, well to think about it that way. That's awesome. This was, this was fantastic. Um, I'm, I think we should probably wind it down a little bit. I mean, I, I would love to do part two or part three someday, but um, I know we want to make space for any other questions that anyone else has. Uh, now's the time. Um, and if you can't think of something now and you're going about your Sunday and all of a sudden you have an imaginary light bulb that goes above your head and you're like, ah, I wanted to ask Dorothy that. How can they find you, Dorothy? How can people find um, you? I'm really responsive on Instagram. And so I have a lot of bartenders across the country. As long as they like hit me up on Instagram, I will like answer immediately. I suck at Facebook. Don't even try. Like, I, I can't do it. Um, but I'm sipping science. So, like, sipping science. And, yeah, you can hit me up. If you ever have any questions, let me know. If you're troubleshooting something, like, any of the things that you have here, you can, like, hit me up. If you're a home bartender and you just want to, like, play around a little more and you don't need anything technical but you just want to know if flavors match, like, seriously, hit me up. Dorothy, you're so kind. You're so generous with your time. Really, really, really appreciate you. Um, can't wait to have you in Halifax uh, next year uh, when we're allowed to uh, high five and, um, and, and hug. Um, information at uh, Drink Atlantic's IG and um, you can check out Sovereign's IG as well for, for the Zoom information tomorrow. Thank you so much. Dorothy, uh, I hope you get to cool off a little bit. Uh, I know it's hot and muggy over there. Thanks for taking time on your Sunday. And uh, we're very grateful that some of this content is going to live in YouTube for a little bit as well. Good day, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.